Well, good morning, everyone, or maybe good afternoon or evening, depending where you're joining us from. Welcome here to the Launchpad and our live Artemis 1 update coverage. NASA expected to host a media teleconference in about seven minutes from now to provide an update on the Artemis 1 rocket and their countdown to uh, the orbital flight test and first ever flight of SLS to the moon. We are expecting to uh, possibly hear a launch date from NASA during today's teleconference, which is uh, what, of course, we're all very excited to hopefully hear about. I will be on the call with the panel uh, during today's coverage, so we'll be listening into that uh, and bringing you full coverage and updates on the possible dis announcement of today's orbital launch date for SLS for Artemis 1. Today's teleconference participants include Jim Free, the Associate Administrator for the Explor Exploration Systems Development Mission, Cliff Lanham, the Senior Vehicle Operations Manager, and Mike Serafin, the Artemis Missions Manager. We're going to take a quick second here before we listen in to the NASA teleconference, as we do have a couple minutes, and remind you just of which launch dates we are looking as a possibility of seeing coming up over the next couple of months. These are the two launch windows. Uh, that we have been given by NASA uh, officially. The one on the left side of your screen has actually official launch times on each of those dates. We do not have the official dates for the uh, later in September, early October window, um, but we do have those official launch times for the early or late September, sorry, early September, late August window. We do have those times there. So uh, take a look at what those dates are. Hopefully we'll have a more targeted T0 date, uh, but we're going to get everything patched in here. But stay with us right here on the Launchpad as we await the NASA Artemis 1 update starting at 11 a.m. Eastern. Stay with us.
Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome here to the Launchpad. And you are joining us for our live coverage of today's Artemis 1 update from NASA. NASA will hold a media teleconference in just a couple of minutes to discuss the next steps for the Artemis 1 mission with the Space Launch System SLS rocket and the Orion spacecraft at NASA's NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Inside the VAB, NASA is preparing SLS for launch, and we're expecting this briefing to get underway in just a moment. If you guys have questions, you can send those to us in the chat, but stay with us right here on the Launchpad.
Good morning. Thank you. I'm Catherine Hambleton with NASA's Office of Communications inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Technicians can continue to prepare SLS and Orion for Artemis 1. The first in a series of increasingly complex missions, Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed flight test that will provide a foundation for human exploration in deep space and demonstrate our commitment and capability to extend human existence to the moon and eventually to Mars. Here to talk with us about the status of Artemis 1 are Jim Free, Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters in Washington, Cliff Lanham, Senior Vehicle Operations Man Manager for the Exploration Ground Systems Program at Kennedy, and Mike Serafin, Artemis Mission Manager from NASA Headquarters. After a brief uh, opening comments from each of our speakers, we will take your questions. And first, we will go to Jim Free. Jim? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for making the time uh, to, to be with us today on, on really a, a special day, uh, anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing uh, 53 years ago. And it's, uh, it's really great to talk about um, this test flight uh, to begin our Artemis program uh, to go back to the moon. And, uh, and you know, this is our first flight, and this is a campaign that we're building. This is a series of missions to, to achieve objectives that um, we're laying out as uh, an agency to do near-term and long-term exploration both on the moon uh, and beyond. So we wanted to kind of give you an update. Um, I know folks are, are really thinking, hey, when are we going to launch? And we want to have Cliff talk to you about the details of what is between now and launch for us and, uh, and, and Mike Serafin to, to share the details of uh, based on when we're hoping to launch, what those missions look like, and, and what we're trying to accomplish. And I'll, I'll just jump right to it. I know folks are, are thinking about the dates, and, and I want to make sure that you know that these are what we're working to today based on how the work's gone in the VAB, and Cliff will share some details on that with you, um, and and how all the assets come together, including uh, how the weather cooperates with us. So, so we have placeholders on the range uh, for August 29th, September 2nd, and September 5th. Um, we have a schedule that, that uh, Cliff and all of our programs have put together that gets us aligned with that date uh, with uh, what we know today, uh, what we know about the repairs we've done since we came back from wet dress, which you know we consider successful. Um, you know the su success for us is we got the T minus 29 seconds. We executed 115 out of 120 commands. We were gimbling the engines. We got the uh, stage to replenish. You heard a lot of that from our program managers the last time. And then when when uh, when we got back, we uh, went to replace some of the uh, seals on the quick disconnects on the uh, tail service mask uh, umbilical, and we found that one of the collets that holds the uh, the umbilical plate on had some loose fasteners. Um, we had to go in and and fix that. Cliff will talk about that in some more detail. That actually gave us a little pause of wondering if we're we were going to be able to make. Uh, launch attempts on those three dates, and, and I stress launch attempts. Um, and uh, uh, Cliff will share with you what's been done since that repair that uh, gave us some confidence to, to talk to you today about the dates that we're holding on the range. Uh, those are dates just like other missions hold, uh, so it's not an agency commitment. We'll, we'll make the agency commitment at the flight readiness review uh, just a little over a week before launch. Um, but these are the dates that the team is working to and has a plan to. That has a lot of work left of things that we'll have to do and, and probably learn from, including closeouts. We'll have to make some decisions, and, and Cliff can talk about the decision to roll out. Um, and, and as Mike Serafin pointed out to me recently, you know, we, we've made some decisions already with uh, some of the activations of batteries that, that have a life before they have to be replaced. So... We're here today to say, hey, we think we're on a good path uh, to get to uh, attempts uh, on those dates. Um, of course, it's the first time we're trying to launch this vehicle. So um, I, I heard the deputy administrator today say she used to tell her family um, when that wanted to come for her launch, she said, uh, plan a seven-day vacation to Florida 
and uh, you might see a launch in there too. So uh, we're, we're trying to make sure that everybody understands this is the first time that uh, we're going to try and launch this vehicle. We're going to be careful. We're going to work hard to meet the, the attempts on those dates that I gave you and, uh, and, and do our best uh, to position ourselves to have the confidence uh, in those dates. So let me turn it over now to, uh, to Cliff and let him walk you through our flow between now and then and uh, some of the things that the team uh, down there has worked through recently. Okay, thank you, Jim, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so since arriving at the vehicle assembly building back on July 2nd, our teams have been pressing ahead to prepare the, the SL Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft for the Artemis One launch. So that has included repairing the source of the hydrogen leak that the engineers identified during the late, uh, last wet dress rehearsal. We have replaced those seals on the core stage and we are in the process of getting postured to do the testing, the retest of those seals uh, to make sure we don't have any uh, leaks there. When we first demated the umbilical plate, we did find a loose fitting uh, on the inside wall of the uh, core stage and it's called a collet and it helps attach the umbilical plate to the rocket. And uh, it was decided that we needed to go in there and to the engine section of the core stage and repair that. Uh, which included tightening up the bolts um, to tighten that collet up. So we did that. Um, that that work is now complete. And again, we're uh, the umbilical is attached, and we're uh, just about ready to get into our uh, retest of the those interfaces. Um, aside from the uh, hydrogen leak repair, we have also been working on the final closeouts on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or the ICPS. Uh, that has included some reaction control system valve uh, testing. We've also changed out a navigation and control assembly unit uh, there. That was all planned work when we got back from WDR, but that work is all now completed. Uh, we have also um, activated our batteries, as Jim mentioned, um, which again uh, puts us on a path towards that late August timeframe uh, for launch. Um, the batteries have been uh, installed into the uh, booster forward assemblies as well as into the uh, ICPS, and we would, uh, we're would we expecting to do the core stage batteries next week. Um, like I mentioned, our teams continue to conduct the final operations before returning to launch pad 39B for the Artemis One mission, which also includes getting into the flight termination system operations. Uh, part of this work involves uh, removing the core stage and booster safe and arm devices, uh, we've um, changing out the uh, command receiver decoder boxes. Um, that's all been planned work for us. Um, and then we're looking to um, get ourselves ready for the actual testing. We will be doing ordnance ops this weekend on the ICPS, which is uh, separate from the flight termination system testing. But uh, all, all we're converging towards that point um, here in the, uh, the early parts of August. Um, and finally, on Orion, we've performed our power testing and have also installed the, uh, some of the payloads, such as the uh, technology demonstration that will test the digital assistance and video collaboration um, in deep space. Um, we've also installed one of the mannequins, uh, Command Commander Munikin um, Campos, which will fly aboard Orion to test the spacecraft systems. So um, we've done a lot of work since getting back into VAB. Uh, we continue to press hard towards uh, getting towards rollout and um, soon we'll be getting into our final um, closeouts of all the different volumes in the uh, spacecraft and uh, get ready for rollout. And with that, I'll pass it over to Mike. Okay, thank you, Cliff, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for following uh, the Artemis One mission here. Um, I'll uh, briefly recap our objectives for this Artemis One test flight. And um, one of the things that I do want to emphasize up front here is that the objectives that I'm going to outline here remain um, the same regardless of which day we launch. So our, our first and our primary objective is to demonstrate Orion's heat shield at lunar reentry conditions. Uh, so we want to demonstrate that it can withstand the, uh, the high speed and high heat that the, uh, that the spacecraft uh, will encounter when it reenters the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, when Orion returns from the moon, uh, we'll be traveling uh, about 24,500 miles an hour, or Mach 32, and experience temperatures half as hot as the sun uh, outside the heat shield. Um, so that is much faster and much hotter than we return, or the temperatures that we see when we return from low Earth orbit 
or when we return from high Earth orbit on Exploration Flight Test 1. While the heat shield has undergone extensive testing on the ground, and uh, a similar design, not this exact design, but the similar design was demonstrated on Exploration Flight Test 1, uh, no aerodynamic or aerothermal test facility can recreate the conditions um, that we will see when we return from lunar uh, reentry and lunar return conditions. So validating the heat shield is our primary objective and is a, is a critical um, activity that we see um, is necessary before we fly crew on Orion on the very next mission. So our second objective is to demonstrate operations and, and all of the uh, flight modes of the rocket and the spacecraft, all of the facilities across all the mission phases. So during the flight test, um, the uh, teams will verify the, uh, the launch vehicle and the spacecraft systems, such as communications, propulsion, navigation systems. Uh, Orion itself will give us further confidence as a, uh, as a human-rated spacecraft that it can tolerate the extreme thermal um, environment of deep space and that we can fly in the deep space environment, including passing outbound and then returning through the Van, Anna, Van Allen radiation belts. Orion's main engine and the solar array wings uh, will need to work as designed, and the operations teams uh, will need to manage across all the flight phases, whether it's pre-launch, launch, launch um, the, uh, the lunar fly, flyby and then uh, return back to the Earth and then recovery. So we've got to demonstrate all of these uh, vehicle systems and the performance and understand the uncertainties uh, across all of the teams and all of the facilities involved across all the mission phases. So our third objective is to retrieve Orion after splashdown. And while uh, engineers will receive data throughout the course of the mission, Retrieving the crew module after splashdown will provide information to engineers to inform future flights. Once we return to the Kennedy Space Center after the mission, technicians will conduct detailed inspections of Orion, retrieve data recorded on board during flight that was not necessarily all telemetry to the ground, and we will reuse components such as the uh, high-precision avionics and retrieve information from the payloads that we flew. Uh, it will also allow NASA to demonstrate its recovery techniques and procedures in anticipation of future crew flights. Our fourth and, uh, and final bucket of objectives is what I like to call bonus objectives, but they're additional uh, objectives that um, are not critical to flying astronauts on, the, uh, on subsequent missions, but, but are important, uh, including engaging the public. Um, a number of our uh, additional objectives in this fourth and final bucket include a demonstration of other capabilities and aspects of the launch vehicle, the spacecraft, uh, the overall integrated systems, and recovery plans. Uh, some of the flight test objectives will include certification of Orion's optical navigation system, deploying 10 CubeSat payloads riding in the uh, Orion stage adapter, operating the technology and bio, biological uh, payloads that, that will be flown inside the crew module on Orion, and collecting imagery throughout and sharing that with the public for, as far as outreach and, uh, and just sharing the mission as, as we experience it all together. So now that I've uh, summarized our primary objectives, I'll tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the planning dates that Jim outlined earlier. So for the August 29th, um, launch attempt. Uh, the uh, launch window open time uh, would be at 8.33 a.m. Eastern uh, for a two-hour window. Um, that would be for a long class mission. Uh, the duration would be 42 days, and the targeted splashdown date would be on October the 10th. The uh, September 2nd date would um, have a window open at 12.48 p.m. Eastern. Again, a two-hour launch window mission duration is a long class mission, but it's a 39 day duration mission landing on October 11th. <clears throat> and then the um, attempt on September 5th would uh, have a launch window open at 5.12 p.m. Eastern, and that is a, a one and a half hour launch window. Uh, again, a long class mission, 42 days landing on October 17th. Um, one thing that I will note about our, uh, our launch attempts in that same time frame is that we do have a uh, cutout or eclipse 
from August uh, 30th through September 1st. So that's a three-day period where um, just due to the uh, sun and earth alignment is Orion is headed outbound on the trajectory. Um, we're unable to produce power um, just because the, uh, the spacecraft would be in the shadow of the earth. Um, so we would have that three-day cutout um, due to an eclipse uh, constraint. Um, so now that I've covered that, um, I'll note that our mission planners have started to build timelines, uh, detailed timelines for each of these, and um, we'll provide another opportunity to talk through those um, in more detail in the next couple of weeks. I'm sure that uh, many of you have mission, listened to the mission overview that uh, has been posted online. Um, and I'll note that that was based on a short class mission, and we're looking at, at long class missions here for the uh, attempts that, that Jim has outlined earlier. Um, but as was stated earlier, the, uh, the milestones and the, uh, and the uh, uh, objectives remain the same, regardless of which opportunity we have. Uh, in order to enter our, uh, our target orbit about the moon, uh, there are four major burns after the translunar injection, which commits us from a um, Earth orbit to a, a lunar intercept. Uh, the four major burns are paired, so there's uh, a pair of maneuvers that allow us to enter the distant retrograde orbit. Uh, the first is called the outbound powered flyby, and the second is called the distant retrograde insertion. Um, after we've coasted for the uh, uh, planned duration in the distant retrograde orbit, uh, we have another paired uh, maneuver sequence that puts us on an Earth return trajectory and, and allows us to depart the distant retrograde orbit. Uh, the first is called the distant retrograde departure, and then the second is called the return powered flyby. And you'll hear more details about those um, as, as we uh, uh, share more, more um, mission planning activities in the next couple of weeks. Um, those uh, maneuvers that I, that I just highlighted are outlined on the mission maps that uh, are already posted online. Uh, the mission availability calendar, just in terms of which, which days we can launch, are also posted online. And you can see where we uh, have opportunities for either a short class or a long class mission, depending on the day that we fly. Um, I want to reinforce what Jim said earlier about this being a test flight. Uh, if you look at the objectives that I outlined a few minutes ago, you can see where our priorities are. Uh, we expect our teams to learn throughout the course of the mission, and our primary objectives essentially include that we complete the mission uh, as planned in order to get to reentry, uh, where we will test the heat shield and recover the spacecraft. Um, our team is prepared to adapt along the way if we encounter challenges outside the mission, and, and there may be some activities uh, is part of the, uh, the overall conduct of the mission uh, that we may elect to not complete, including in that fourth bucket of objectives, our, our bonus objectives, um, if we have to deviate from the mission as planned. So we may have fewer opportunities to do things like certify the optical navigation system or, or imagery objectives or payload uh, data takes. But part of my role is to, um, is to support the team throughout these critical decision points in the course of the mission. Uh, including assessment of the situation or circumstances that we uh, may find ourselves in uh, in the course of the mission that go beyond established or, or pre-decided criteria or the flight rules that we've out outlined and we spent extensive time planning ahead of the mission. Um, and then uh, if we need to, we'll work through those uh, situations and decide what the, the appropriate course of action is. I can say from personal experience as a flight director and including uh, the, uh, the Exploration Flight Test 1 mission, which was the maiden flight test of Orion, that the next several weeks will be a flurry of activity uh, as we finalize our mission planning and prepare the rocket and the spacecraft for these launch attempts. Launch day is going to be here before we know it. Uh, while we continue to work through each task step by step, today's anniversary is a good reminder of what a privilege it is to be a part of a mission like this. It's not just the Artemis One mission, but it's a bigger picture of returning to the moon and preparing to go to Mars, and we try not to lose sight of that in our day-to-day -day work. So with that, I'll, I just want to thank you, and I'll turn it back to Catherine. Thank you, Mike. We'll now go to our question and answer session. Uh, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. 
Your phones are on mute now, and the operator will open your mic when, you're, when we're ready and close your mic after you ask your question. Uh, we please ask that you stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. If we have time, we will allow reporters to ask a second question. So the first question will be from Marcia Dunn of Associated Press. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, I'm wondering, eclipses aside, is it generally every three days that you could take a stab at launching Artemis? Um, what's the value of a long class versus a short class mission? And lastly, just one mannequin on board, thanks. Um, Cliff, do you want want me to take a crack at that one? You can back me up. Sure, go ahead, Mike. Um, let's see. So I'll start with your la your last question, Marcia. Um, there there are three um, mannequins on board. There's uh, Helga, Zohar, and then uh, Commander uh, Munikin Campos. Um, they are they are uh, gathering flight test data uh, throughout for us. Um, the value of a short class versus a long class mission, um, we will get as much mission and as much data as, as we can out of uh, whatever opportunity presents itself to us. So um, we can get what we need um, for the objectives that, that I've outlined um, for either class of mission. And, and that is why we have the priorities in place. Um, we will take the opportunity in front of us uh, that um, where we where we uh, have a have a good opportunity to uh, to launch safely and successfully, um, so we don't have a strong preference whether it's a short or a long class mission. Um, what Jim outlined earlier is really that um, from a from a schedule and a in a in a preparation standpoint of the of the flight hardware, um, the schedule just happens to put us in a posture where we think we've got a couple of opportunities. Um, for a long class mission in late August, early September, um, if the if the work um, that that Cliff outlined um, occurs as planned. Um, in terms of attempts, um, we we have various constraints, and depending on whether we've loaded the vehicle with cryo or not, and how much cryo we've used, um, will determine largely what the next attempt is. But once we've loaded the vehicle, um, it's a minimum of 48 hours uh, to the next attempt. It could be as much as 72 hours. Um, if we have not loaded the vehicle with cryo, um, depending on the team's readiness and the reason that we scrubbed or, or decided to not, to not tank, uh, we, could, we could turn around and potentially go as, as early as the next day uh, presuming that there wasn't a performance or an eclipse constraint that was staring at us. So um, I, it's, it's a fairly complicated answer. Um, you know, it is, it is feasible that if there's not a hard cutout like the eclipse constraints that I, that I outlined, that we could go the next day if it was, you know, just horrible weather at the Cape and we decided to not even tank, um, if possible, we could, we could go the very next day. Um, but if, if we decided to tank, and, and we needed to replenish just hydrogen, then it's 48 hours. If we needed to replenish hydrogen and oxygen, it could be as much as 72 hours. So it's, it's not a singular answer, but there are, there are many uh, variables in place. And, and depending on how far we got into the countdown, the reason that we, that we decided to not go that day, whether it was range, uh, an issue with the range or a, a ground system that we could quickly resolve, depending on whether it was a, a technical issue with the vehicle that we needed more time to, to investigate or depending on whether it was just simply we loaded the vehicle and, and, um, and, 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 you know, things stacked against us and, and the, um, we just didn't get off in the, in the planned window, um, that, that will determine the next attempt. So I, I hope I answered your question there. And Cliff, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I don't, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. And Marcia, we do have more information about each of those mannequins on our media resources page for Artemis uh, at nasa.gov slash Artemis1. Our next question is from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Yeah, hey guys, thanks very much. Um, I don't know who this is for, probably for Jim. I mean, would you attempt launch period 25 if you only had two launch opportunities? And I'm asking that to make sure, given the cutouts and the SLS recycle options, given the fueling constraints, 
I'm just, I mean, you've got three if you, if the 29th stays in play, but if it doesn't, I'm guessing you would only have two. And would you press ahead if you only had two opportunities? And finally, could someone explain the flight termination system battery and whatever clock starts ticking? I'm, I'm curious when that clock starts and how many days it gives you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Bill. You know, I'm, I'm going to let Cliff answer your second question first because it kind of goes to your first question. So, Cliff, you want to talk about the FTS batteries? Sure. So, um, what we have to do is there's an ordinance connects that will be uh, finalized, and then uh, we get into the actual testing. So, um, when we do that FTS testing, um, we'll uh, we have a lot we have testing to do that's um, required. 15 days prior to launch, and that starts the clock. Um, right now, we are working with the range to see, and, and the SLS program to see if we can uh, uh, extend that somewhat, um, uh, because we do have some challenges right now as we um, complete that test and all our final closeout work, uh, particularly in the core stage inner tank, um, to get to a point where we're ready to roll out. So we're working that. Um, with the range uh, through the launch director and the SLS program. Um, there's also another uh, requirement that says you, you should have launched by um, you know, 20 days after you do that test. And again, with our um, three attempts, we do start, um, we do have issues with that uh, timing. And again, that's being worked with the range at this point. And um, so that's kind of our plan at the, right now. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hey, 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 Catherine, just, just to answer his, his first question, would we go with the two opportunities if that's all we had? I think there's a there's a big decision point before we leave the VAB that obviously Cliff has uh, and, and all the programs way into of uh, are we ready to go? What's our feasibility because of that clock? Uh, if we're out at the pad already, and we had two launch opportunities, I would think uh, to, to we have cycles on the vehicle every time we roll out and back. So we want to maximize the opportunities that we had, especially with the opportunity to get a longer class mission. So uh, there's there's steps all along the way, Bill, that I think we'll, we'll look at. And uh, Catherine and, and the team have a really good plan at uh, briefings uh, running up to, to launch with a, a lot of the agency leadership, a lot of the uh, other uh, folks that are, are, are doing the work. So we'll have opportunities to share that with you as you go. But obviously the first big step is rolling out and that sets the, the clock on the FTS batteries. So thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Jim. Our next question is from Elizabeth Howell of space.com. Hello, this is probably following up from Bill's and a couple of other questions, but I really wanted to zero out on the decision process to roll back to the pad. How far does a rocket need to be? Like, what kind of tests does it need to pass? Um, how far do you need to be in terms of making sure it's ready? What kind of things are is it supposed to be passing, I suppose, before you can even get it out to the pad to make sure that it's going to be working? Yeah, that so, uh, so, do you want me to answer that, Jim? Yes, please, Cliff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we have uh, what we call our um, OMRSs or our operation maintenance requirements that define all our test requirements for the entire vehicle. And um, all of those will be um, the ones that require um, us to get into our uh, closeouts in the different volumes will be tested. So we have um, a strict set of requirements that we'll be looking at and testing to, to say that the vehicle is ready. Um, right now, we would uh, close out all the volumes of the vehicle. And that, what that would include um, would be basically the Orion, um, the core stage forward skirt, the um, engine section, and then um, all those volumes would be closed before we got into our flight termination system testing. And then uh, once we do our flight termination system testing, and again, all this is defined by requirements that the programs have come together on and approved and said, you must do these things. Um, we would get into our core stage inner tank uh, closeouts, which comes after FTS, because that's where um, all the main work with the flight termination system is occurring. And then uh, we would button up the door on the uh, core stage inner tank. At that point, um, we would be ready to roll. Thanks, Cliff. Our next question is from Kristen Fisher of CNN. <clears throat> hey, guys. Um, 
Can y'all hear me? Sorry. There we go. Yeah. Having an issue with my mute button. Sorry. Okay. Um, so given some of the scheduling issues during that, that first wet dress rehearsal surrounding the, the Axiom 1 flight, I, I'm just wondering how NASA intends to handle scheduling surrounding the Crew-5 mission if uh, the first Artemis launch misses this first window. Uh, can you just kind of walk through which mission gets priority? Thanks. Yeah, let me start, and I'll let, I'll, let Mike, I'll let Mike weigh in. Um, you know, we, we obviously, before Crew-5 slipped, we were working closely with them, trying to help them uh, manage uh, things around the uh, cutouts that, that they have for, uh, for Soyuz, um, how they do the, the crew handovers. Um, so we, we work closely together uh, at my level with Kathy Leaders, uh, Mike Serafin coordinates with uh, Steve Stitch and commercial crew. Um, so we're going to put the same thing into practice uh, if we end up going towards the end of September. Uh, obviously, we, we have to, as I mentioned, balance their needs on ISS versus when we're trying to launch and the risks that we have of some of the limited life things that, uh, that are out there for us. So, Mike, you want, you want to add to that, please? Uh, Jim, you said it well. Um, it, the, probably the only thing I would emphasize is that we keep the uh, communication channels open, uh, regardless of, of who is on the range um, in the in the proximate time frame that we are um, looking to attempt either a wet dress or or launch attempt. So, um, you know, the range schedule is something that we look at routinely, um, and then when we see the potential for a, a, a convergence of, of activities, um, you know, we, we start um, understanding that other, that other program or that other customers, uh, drivers and constraints. We share our drivers and constraints with them. And um, it, it, from there, um, we, you know, we just, we work together to, uh, to find a solution that works best for everyone. Um, and if, if there is a, um, just a, a situation where we find ourselves where we both uh, have a need at the same time time frame, then it then it gets elevated to to folks like Jim uh, to, for a decision. Thank you. Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Hi, good morning. Thanks for doing this. First, a quick question. I think this would put the rollout on August 18th. Um, if you do target the 29th, uh, just confirm that. And then let's say you do get to the pad and, and then due to weather, or some minor technical issues you find during countdown, you scrub those three opportunities. Do you have to roll back to the VAB to do the flight termination system work? Um, or can that be serviced on the pads? In other words, if you don't make a launch by September 5th, would your next attempt have to move to launch period 27? Thanks. So this is Cliff. Um, so yes, in terms of the August 18th, that would be our targeted rollout date at this point um, for a 29th of August um, attempt. And if we did have to roll back for the flight termination system, um, we because we didn't get off the pad, we would go into the um, we would have to go into the inner tank and do some additional testing. Um, to reset that clock. There is the possibility with that that we could potentially um, hit the end of 26, launch period 26, um, but that would, be, um, that would be a real challenge for us, I'll be honest with you, um, but we would certainly give it our best shot um, at that point. And Mike, I don't know if you might want to add something there. Uh, yeah, the, the, only, the only thing I would add, uh, Cliff, is that um, the FTS work is something that we need to do in the VAB. Yeah, good point, Mike. We do have to roll back um, to do that work. Thank you. Our next question will be from Stephen Clark of Space Flight Now. Thanks, uh, Eric. I actually asked my question about the rollout date, but I'll follow up on that. Uh, when, like before rollout, how soon before Central leaving the VAB, do you complete that end-to-end -end testing? Is it, the, is it the 17th? Is it the 16th of August? When is that date? Thanks. So that test will uh, be completed around the uh, 11th, 12th of August, if we were to roll out on the 18th. Thank you. All right, our next question is from 
David Curley of Discovery Channel. Thanks very much. Mike Serafin, uh, can you talk a little bit about the heat shield? This is kind of unprecedented. Um, what are you worried about and how confident are you um, that it will work? Thank you. Yeah, David, uh, that's that's a great question. Um, obviously, the heat shield is a um, it's a safety critical um, piece of hardware, and um, it is something that absolutely has to work to protect the uh, the crew and the spacecraft um, during the reentry phase. So th there are a number of things that that we've learned, and, and this is a this is a new design. It's an ablative material. It's a proprietary uh, material called Avcoat, and it's in a uh, block design, um, uh, unlike the um, the Apollo uh, heat shield design. Um, this this is built in in blocks of ablative material, and you know there are things that we've talked about from an engineering perspective, and and have some amount of test data on like uh, the possibility for hot spots or uh, erosion uh, in or around the, uh, the gaps um, between the blocks. Um, the team has, has spent considerable time and effort um, working the, the appropriate thickness and the appropriate gapping between the blocks. Um, but there, there is the potential that, you know, because we can't test this fully on the ground, that through the reentry flight test that we could see something that um, we didn't anticipate. Uh, for, for those reasons, uh, the vehicle is heavily instrumented, uh, and, and we intend to gather um, plenty of data about the performance of it, uh, and, and we'll use that to inform not only our flight readiness uh, for Artemis II, but also uh, some of the margins uh, and uncertainties that we're carrying um, on this first flight and, and potentially buy those down uh, on future flights. Um, the, the other thing on this mission that is a little unique is that we're doing a skip reentry profile. So uh, we're actually going to dip uh, into the Earth's atmosphere not once but twice. And that skip reentry profile is, is something that, um, you know, needs, needs to um, be controlled from a reentry perspective perspective, our, our attitude control system needs to uh, maintain the heat shield uh, forward at all times as we, as we perform that skip reentry uh, and then um, do it in such a way that we don't overstress the vehicle uh, from an aerodynamic and structural loading standpoint, but also that, that we don't come in so shallow that we literally um, uh, don't get aerodynamic capture and skip back out um, of the Earth's atmosphere and just, just kind of pass the Earth. So, so there's a precision reentry corridor. There's uh, attitude control uh, that's required to uh, successfully perform the skip reentry, and then and then there's the, um, the aerodynamic heating and aerodynamic uh, structural loading on the vehicle that are all things that we're looking at. And and we've got uh, again a heavily instrumented vehicle to to monitor all of those things and all the conditions that we're looking at. Thank you, and we have more information about the skip re-entry on the Media Resources tab on the Artemis One page of NASA.gov as well. Our next question is from Ken Kramer of Space Up Close. Oh, hi, thank you for doing this, and uh, good, good luck with everything. Um, I'd like to follow up on uh, flight termination system questions from several other colleagues. Can you please explain why, why it's only 20 days from the rollout and describe the work you need to do uh, in the VAB and, and how long it takes. And I'd like to know also, uh, I thought the shuttle was out there longer. So how, how does a flight termination system for Artemis compare to uh, the shuttle? Thanks. So Mike, I don't know if you want to take this. I don't have uh, history with the shuttle flight termination system. Um, or <laughs> yeah, I, I would be I would be speculating if I yeah. if I gave an answer to the comparison of the shuttle program, um, but um, but my sense is we had access at the pad, um, but we would need to confirm that we could follow up with you afterward. But go, yeah, go Ken, ahead. Maybe, yeah, no, I was going to say, Ken, maybe we can um, get with you offline on this and and get uh, a little deeper expertise for that. Um, 
to help answer that question for you. But from our standpoint, I believe the 20 days, and again, um, the launch director is the primary interface with the Eastern Range on the FTS system is, um, you know, uh, batteries and um, and reliability and those types of things. But I, I think it would probably be best if we um, took that question offline to the launch director. Thanks, Ken. We'll follow up with you on that one. Our next question is from Daryl Majima, the door. Hi, Daryl, can you hear us? This is for Daniel. Hi, Daryl, your mic is open. All right. Um, it sounds like we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, Daryl, if you're able to rejoin the queue, just press star one and we'll come back to you. Um, actually, that looks like that's all the questions that we have in the queue. Uh, Daryl, if you need to, you can follow up with us by email. If you have a particular question. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the media resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis dash one in about an hour. And to follow along with the updates for Artemis one, please go to the Artemis blog at blogs.nasa.gov slash Artemis. Thanks again, and that will conclude our call. And there we have it. The official Artemis 1 launch dates have been set. The team's now targeting three different launch dates, which was expected for the upcoming launch window starting in just a couple of weeks. We're going to pull this launch window here on screen right away. If you guys have questions, let us know in the chat, and we'll work on answering those live here for the next couple of minutes before we wrap up. But NASA officially confirming August 29th, 2022, the first targeted launch date of the Artemis 1 launch vehicle with backups on September 2nd and September 5th. If it was your first time here, though, before you head out, engage that subscribe button. We are going to be fully live on site. We have confirmed with NASA that TLP does have press accreditation to bring you guys full launch coverage from the press site just three miles away from the pad. So we are going to be all team on deck down at Kennedy to bring you full coverage of the launch of Artemis 1 as we get ready to head back to the moon in the first time in 50 years. And what a great day to do it on the anniversary of Apollo 11 landing on the surface. Really awesome thing there. Uh, if you'd like to help support us and bring you the best possible coverage, we've got some huge plans on what we're trying to do uh, when we come down there. Take a look in the description. There's a GoFundMe link and a Patreon. If you guys would consider signing up on there, all of that goes 100% into equipment costs to bring you guys the best possible coverage of the Artemis 1 launch, as well as we're getting ready for the launch of Starship, the return of Falcon Heavy, the first flight of Vulcan Centaur, and so much more. So we uh, really do appreciate your guys' support there. Uh, but there we have it, three launch dates, August 29th, 2022, starting at 8.33 a.m. Eastern Time. We could see a 42-day mission. These are long-duration missions, which was not expected for the first flight. The September 2nd date, a 39-day mission starting at 12.48 p.m. Eastern Time. And September 5th is the last backup in this window uh, at 5.12 p.m. Uh, for a 42-day mission. Each of these days is a 120-minute, 120-minute, and a 90-minute launch window. So they do have a chance there. Keep in mind, if they go for fueling on the 29th and have to scrub, they will not get to try again till the 2nd. The reason there's a gap from the 2nd to the 5th, if they start fueling on the 2nd, they need at least 48 hours to turn around to be able to recycle because of uh, the rocket and the fuel tanks and everything, as well as the tank farm. So if they don't fuel on the 2nd, they could maybe target the 3rd. But if they start fueling operations on the 2nd, then they are pushed at least guaranteed to the 4th. But they would like to target the 5th. If they miss the 5th, they're done. They have to wait to the not next launch window. And it sounds like they do not think they could meet that. Having to roll back to the VAB, do some work on the rocket to reset it, roll it back out. So it sounds like if we don't make this launch window, we're going to see about a month and a half delay to the end of uh, October window 
uh, which opens on October 17th and runs until Halloween on October 31st uh, and has a number of launch opportunities in there. If you guys have questions, send those in the chat. We'll be answering those uh, live here. You can just make sure you tag us at the launch pad uh, so we can get those in the chat there. But uh, very exciting to finally have official launch dates. Uh, we've pinned to the chat here uh, a link to our shop and our SLS gear. We're going to roll out a few more options on our shop over the next couple of days. But uh, we're going to put in a countdown on how long you have to order your Artemis 1 gear uh, to make sure that you can receive it in time for this launch window. And that's going to be only about two, uh, two weeks from now. So in the next two weeks, make sure you get your Artemis 1 gear ordered. Uh, if you guys want to be repping some TLP gear uh, for the Artemis 1 launch. Also, make sure you have joined, followed us over on di Twitter. Uh, we'll be live tweeting updates towards the countdown and raw updates on the field. And join us over on our Discord as well. Uh, we are working on some plans on possibly a watch party uh, for the launch, or at least a kind of pre-launch or post-launch uh, TLP meetup down in Florida as well. So if you're in the Kennedy Space Center region, make sure you're on Discord uh, to follow along there. That will likely be a members-only one, so make sure you've uh, become a TLP member before then uh, if you want to have details sent your way about a TLP meetup down in Florida as we count down to the Artemis 1 launch date. Uh, not long from now, we are getting very, very close. We are just over a month away from this. We are less than a month away from rollout of Artemis 1, which will be the first moon rocket rolled out to the pad in over 50 years. That is stocked and prepped and all payloads are on board and ready to go. So very exciting there. Shannon Barker's asking, what are the launch window times? If you head over to our Twitter, we have live tweeted out this calendar uh, that's on your screen now, so you'll be able to save that off. But the 29th is the first target of the day. They can launch anywhere between 8.33 a.m. and 10.33 a.m. on that day. On September 2nd, they can launch from 12.48 p.m. to 2.48 p.m. And on September 5th, they can launch from 5.12 p.m. to 6.32 p.m. So we've got uh, a 120-minute window, a 120-minute window, and a 90-minute window uh, on these dates. And that's what they're targeting. They're not possible to go earlier than the 29th. They said that's not possible. But uh, we could see them roll the second date to the third uh, or the 4th even, but that would be rare because if they go to the 4th, then they can't go to the 6th. and it's a, it, it's a balancing game for it. So they've got three solid dates that they think they can meet. Uh, so we're very excited to uh, finally see uh, the, uh, the launch of Artemis 1 happen. Years of delays, but we're finally going back to the moon. But if it was your first time here, welcome. My name's Zach. I'm the founder and host here. At the Launchpad here at TLP, it's our mission to inform and inspire the explorers of tomorrow. And this was our live coverage of today's Artemis 1 update from NASA, revealing the three targeted launch dates for Artemis 1 heading back to the moon. If it was your first time here, make sure you've engaged that subscribe button to never miss space briefings like today, live launch coverage, space news updates, and exclusive one-on-one -on -one interviews. We've got a bunch of Artemis 1 Inter uh, team interviews coming out later this week so make sure you have subscribed so you get to see those and hear from some of the Artemis 1 team as we get ready for the orbital flight test and uh, make sure you have joined us over on our discord that's where our space community hangs out if you're a TLP member on Patreon or here on YouTube you can get behind the scenes access early video access on in the field raw updates and more as well as invites to exclusive TLP member meetups uh, and follow us on Twitter so you never miss space news or space announcements as they happen. But lots of uh, exciting things ahead. We've got a very busy month getting ready uh, to be on site at NASA Kennedy Space Center. But we are going back to the moon and that's going to wrap it up for us here today. Make sure you've engaged that subscribe button. But for now, this is Zach signing off from TLP Network Studios. We'll see you soon and make sure you've subscribed so you can join us on our countdown to the launch of Artemis 1. We're going back to the moon. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.